Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of Thursday's Lessons, a show where we draw lessons from various points of history, nerdy topics, culture, whatever really we can draw lessons from. I am Thursday. And I am Varmint. And on this episode, we're going to be talking about two shows, Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra. And, of course, since we draw lessons from things on this show, we're going to be drawing a few topical lessons in today's world, I think. Especially our very divided world. This show, if you've seen it, I'm sure you can agree, has a lot of important messages. And we'll be talking about more of them in probably another episode coming up very shortly. But for now, we're going to start with the lesson about friendship and how people need other people. It's a very simple concept that nobody can exist in a vacuum. Nobody is alone. But more importantly, no matter how strong you are, how brave, whatever, it doesn't matter. No matter how much of whatever you are, eventually you're going to need somebody to back you up. You're going to need somebody there to support you. You're going to need somebody there, if nothing else, to help guide you when you're confused, to help center yourself when you're enraged. There are moments where I'm sure everybody can agree that had somebody else been there to tell you, hey man, cool off or something, you might not have done something stupid. We all need other people there to help us, even if we're strong enough to fight our battles by ourselves. You need somebody to come back to afterwards and, you know, make you laugh or smile or something. Or it's all just kind of drudgery, isn't it? Both shows reinforce regularly that you need other people. That both, like, Zuko, for example, as soon as he leaves his uncle and tries to go off on his own, the world reinforces for him constantly that, no, you actually have to be with other people. You can't do these things on your own. Otherwise, you do have to be a terrible person. Yeah. You have to do things you're going to feel guilty for in that case. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to be selfish. Yeah. You need not just other people to survive or exist or overcome challenges because the show has plenty of that in it where even someone as strong as the Avatar can't win fights alone. Well, I was going to say the namesakes of both shows, both Korra and Aang the Airbender, Yeah, both the Avatars get smacked down by the world when they try and do things on their own too. Oh yeah, when they forsake their friends and they're like, I have to do this by myself. Aang, when he, you know, thinks that, when the world thinks that he's dead, he gets all upset about that and decides, you know, I need to do this on my own, right? And he flies off. And, well, you know, without that nice ship his friends had to keep him safe on and without, you know, guidance and everything, he gets lost in a storm and he ends up still getting saved by another friend. And, you know, Korra is replete with examples of this. Every time, pretty much, Korra tries to run headfirst into a problem by herself, it goes wrong. Because she doesn't have mo the most wisdom. She doesn't have the greatest guidance. She's headstrong. And that's what, you know, that's why her and Tenzin are such a good combination. Tenzin sort of lacks that impulsiveness for the most part. He's too reserved and too analytical, while Korra's too impulsive and too irrational. And together, they sort of like a balance. They yin to yang sort of deal. Where together, Korra pushes Tenzin to do more, and Tenzin sort of pushes Korra to do a little less. See, but at the beginning <clears throat> when they meet each other, all they do is rub each other the wrong way. Exactly, because they haven't learned how to work together. And that's sort of that little sub-lesson to this point about friendship and working together is that... It requires investment. It does. It requires you sometimes to make adjustments to what you're doing, to change your expectations. You know, there's a reasonable level, of course. Don't change your entire life for somebody just because you want them to be your friend. But sometimes to truly get along with other people, you have to mitigate the more unfortunate aspects of yourself. You want to talk over people. You want to be heard first. You have to work to control these impulses that might be troublesome or unpleasant, you know? Friends help make you better. Yes. And that's a very resonant theme for this show, is that where everybody starts at in the beginning of the show versus where they end. If you look at how they've developed, and not just their development, but how they've developed because of the other characters' presences, 
you can see that leading very well into the second point, everybody affects everybody else around you. Nobody is just the product of themselves, right? <laughs> <laughs> now it's a show. <laughs> Nobody is created or raised in a vacuum, right? And when you take that idea, it, it really behooves you to pick good friends, trustworthy people. You know, they don't have to be the best people in the world. You don't have to make all of your friends saints, but your company affects you over time. You call bad people who believe in doing bad things your friends, you will be warped. Look at Zuko. Well, no, actually, a, at, a, much be, a, a much better example that's more resonant, I think, when it comes to friend relationships is Toph and the way that she has to adjust from her upbringing <laughs> and the way that she's yes. so selfish and self-centered and oh, things yeah. are about her. She's used to being on her own, and mm -hmm. she has to have that conversation with Iroh over tea oh, yes. in order to be able to grow enough as a person to get along with her group. And not just that, she had to learn a bit of empathy for what they meant by what they were saying. She assumed, like so many people do, the intent behind people's actions when she didn't really understand it. She assumed it was because they thought she was weak that they helped her. Not, you know, what, as Iroh explains it, it's only natural for the people who love you to want to help you, whether or not you need it. And it was coming from a place of kindness and not pity. And once she overcomes that misconception, she can humble herself and admit she was wrong and move on and become friends with people. And from there, it's sort of the rest of the show. <laughs> but look at Zuko, right? Zuko is a great example of somebody who was not a bad person, really, but was raised in an environment that tried to make him a bad person. An environment that tried to make him Azula. Yes. She's the extreme end of what he could have become. Oh, well, she was the intended result, basically. Azula is a little carbon copy of her ambitious, tyrannical father. She's a weapon that you can point. Yes. Oh, yes. She is a prodigious power in the world, you could say. And she is treated as such. Not a person, but a power. She is treated as a weapon and an accomplished, beloved weapon, but only if it performs. Well, she was useful. Yes. That's why she was uh, put before Ozai's uh, father, the previous Fire Lord. Azulon, yeah. Because her skills were useful to him to demonstrate. Zuko was not useful. It's interesting there that, you know, one took after one parent, one took after the other. and But again, Zuko is only teetering on that edge. Right. Where he had multiple influences, though, to his mother, whom apparently on that moment of Ember Island realizations in the third season where Azula almost has that reflective moment where she's like, you know, I could be upset that my mom loves Zuko more than me, but... And then she gets that momentary sullen face. My own mother thought I was a monster. And for a moment... It, you, you, there's that regret. There's that troubled teen there. And then she looks up. Well, she was right, of course, but it's still her. Or she's sort of been raised to accept and deal with that sort of implicit fear and hatred by embracing it. Which, when it fails her, starts driving her to paranoid insanity. When May and Ty Lee turn on her, she loses it because, well, you know, it's like Machiavelli even talks about fear can only hold its grip but for so long before it gives way to hate. And no matter how much her friends care about her genuinely, you see how they meet and how she manipulates them into working with her. Yeah. You can tell that she is just a bad influence. Azula attempts to make other people like her. It's a cycle. She was raised that way. And it's not a justification or an excuse. It's just a fact that she was a, she's a product of her upbringing as much as her own twisted nature. The shows, both of them, explore how everybody is the hero of their own story. Even the most evil of people have a reason for what they're doing. Something that makes it make sense to them. A justification for this horror. You know, Sozin proposes um, the war to Roku during the wedding 
uh, we have so much prosperity and wealth and how great we are and how I want to share this with the rest of the world. He doesn't say, I want to invade the world and enslave it. He says, I want to share our prosperity with it, which is sort of a code thing for, you know, the white man's burden and stuff that in our world. That's sort of that we are so much more prosperous, a.k.a. we perceive ourselves as more advanced than these people. And due to their being more primitive than us, we assume they need our help. And by help, we mean take over and show them how it's done. But it comes from a misplaced benevolence in a lot. The white man's burden basically assumes that people need the white man's guidance to become better, that they're suffering in their natural state of ignorance, and that they could be made better. We could help them. It's completely misplaced, of course, and insulting, but you can't say it doesn't attempt to come from a good place, which makes it hard to fight. Because, but this feels good. This makes me a good person, people could say. We're elevating these people and helping them not live in barbarous conditions. How can you call me a monster? But it's just two perspectives of the same event. One of them, of course, is very misguided, but that doesn't make it completely wrong, at least in the intention. And if you want to reach somebody, because, oh boy, is this a message in both shows. If you want to reach somebody, you have to understand them. You have to sympathize with them. You don't have to agree with them at all. You can fight them to the last to stop them. But if you want to reach them and convince them they're wrong, you have to know first why they think they're right. But they believe that they're superior, and they won't listen to me. Well, then you might have to stop them. You might have to fight them to the last. Like, look at season two with Korra. She has to destroy Unalak. She can't reason with him in the end. She understands, though. When she refuses to close the spirit portal, she gets why he was angry. She gets the reason behind his frustration and what twisted him so much. Sure, he was power-hungry and greedy from the start. But his points about the spirits were not based in complete lies. He was right about many things on that. And she understood that. Even though she destroyed him, she still understood what he was talking about. She can't beat Kuvira until she empathizes with why she had to do this. Because just destroying her would make her a martyr, throw the world into more chaos. She had to make Kuvira give it up. And the only way she could do that was to understand her suffering to understand her fear, the thing that drove her to these increasingly irrational and increasingly horrible choices, this fear, this need for control and a sense of powerlessness, which Cora could only understand after she had been poisoned and made to feel powerless and frustrated and weak herself. Then she could walk in Kuvira's shoes, see her nation become destroyed and chaotic and in ruin and know that feeling of helplessness and powerlessness and lack of control herself. Then she could not only beat Kuvira, but she could reason with her and then make her see that she was wrong and end it herself. Which is the only way a peaceful resolution to that conflict would happen. Like, what's the line out of Doctor Who? Listen to me, listen. I just, I just want you to think. Do you know what thinking is? It's just a fancy word for changing your mind. I will not change my mind. Then you will die stupid. Alternatively, you could step away from that box. You could walk right out of that door and you could stand your revolution down. No. I'm not stopping this, Doctor. I started it. I will not stop it. You think they'll let me go after what I've done? Where he's giving her responsibility, putting it on her shoulders to do something about it, to she has to change her mind and then she has to do better. That, ah, uh, that, that speech. Yeah. No, that's, that's that point. If you want to make somebody, and this is true, always, if you want to have a chance of making somebody on your opposition give up, you have to first understand why they are who they are in that movement. You have to understand what made them choose this action. Look at Amon, villain of season one of Korra. They didn't save him or anything, but they understood him enough to beat him in the way that mattered, which was strip him of his control, strip him of his image. Beating him as a person didn't matter. They had to beat the 
image, the icon that was Amon. And the only way to do that was to understand who he really was, to understand the truth of him. That he had a pure heart, even as twisted and fucked up as it is from his, you know, fucked up upbringing. He was a rebellion against evil because his father was Yukon, heartless bastard who attempted to make them into bloodbending masters to get his revenge on Republic City. That is what he turned against, seeing bending as evil because it corrupted his father. It tried to corrupt him. It created things like bloodbending. It created the war, the Fire Nation war. He, need, he felt like if you ended bending, you'd stop all of that. He was wrong. People will fight over anything. But his intentions were motivated by goodness, which made him difficult to fight, difficult to go up against. Someone who was honestly motivated by the desire to do the right thing is difficult to fight in public opinion. They have the support of the people. Right. It doesn't matter if he's actually wrong. He comes from a right place. He's proposing shit to fix things. At least he says he is, you know. He has goals. He has motivation. He's looking out for the common people. At that point, it almost doesn't matter if he's wrong or right. He's fighting for these people that feel left out, oppressed. Oh, it sounds like Trump, doesn't it? Everyone got bamboozled by another fraud, but he said the right things. He spoke like he was one of them, even though he wasn't. <laughs> to pull off the mask, and he's a fraud. But he said the right things. He sounded like he was coming from a place of good. Oh, yeah, you know, he's, he says some messed up stuff and everything, but he really, he just wants to get in there as a guy who's not a politician and just fix things. He's got a good place. He's, he's trying to do the right thing. Look, we've, we've found the group that we need to blame for the problem. And as soon as we get rid of that group, then the problem will be fixed. I mean, you know, the immigrants or uh, the benders, right? <laughs> <clears throat> we just need to purify them. I'm... I will now cleanse you of your impurity. Yeah, it gets fucked up, don't it? It's an analogy, people. Um, this hey, is you... wrong. This is akin to cultural genocide. This is the destruction of people. That is not the answer. But how did he get there? It started with noble intentions, a, a deep, passionate desire to fight against injustice. Like, oh, who was that guy in season three, wasn't it? Zahir? Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. He, he fought against tyranny, corruption, and the nobility. How they hated people who were, you know, his whole group, they hated the nobility for trampling on the rights of those beneath them, for taking them for granted, abusing their freedom. And what does he actually do? He destroys an evil dictator. Oh, the Earth Queen was a heartless bitch who was happy enslaving people and using people for her benefit to no remorse or guilt whatsoever. She was a, basically a sociopath. She had no feelings for anyone that wasn't herself. And her death should not be mourned. <laughs> but? And see, that's the thing. What he did afterwards was wrong. Her death with no one to fill the vacuum is wrong. Because that creates anarchy. And despite what Zahir thinks about the human natural state being disorder, reality is based in hierarchy. Reality is based in a pecking order. It's just a natural progression of things. He was wrong. He missed the pattern in nature and assumed it chaos, it seems. It's just a delicate pattern that often we cannot see until we really pay attention. Doesn't mean it's not there and doesn't mean it's not important. And, you know, his assassination of the Earth Queen was just, right? But it was also wrongly executed. And <laughs> wrongly executed. Ooh, anyway. Poetically executed. Yes. <laughs> the air. <laughs> but for your people, freedom is like air. And when deprived it, they will see nothing but darkness. As he chokes her to death with air bending. Yeah. But, like, look, Kavir is the greatest example of this, though. To protect her nation, her people, all of that. She ends up building super weapons that could destroy everything. What is she, what, what, like, what she's does fighting. She, what does she sacrifice by the end, and what even is she fighting for? And by the end, they're fighting over the rubble of her public city. Like, they destroyed it all. But it all started with the best of intentions. She wanted to unify her people, protect them, avenge past wrongs. Republic City was once Earth Kingdom territory, unlawfully seized during the invasion of the Fire Nation. It was never given back. 
Salfu was an Earth Kingdom territory taken during the chaos, basically. Made independent. These are legitimate claims. These are legitimate grievances that even today would at least deserve being heard. But where she goes with them, there's that problem with being self-righteous in every one of these cases. And almost, you know, look at how much it occurs in the real world where self-righteousness and self-assured justice becomes impervious to any dissension, doubt, or reason. Where it becomes infallible, the quest worth anything. Well, we're fighting to protect the people. Well, we might have to kill a bunch of them to protect them. Well, then you're wrong. If your quest requires you to destroy the thing you are working towards to achieve it, it is paradoxically wrong. If you have to destroy the world to save it, you're destroying the world, not saving it. It's a very simple thing that's repeated in how many different animes, shows, medias. Where the Ultron. Guy's like, I will save the world by purging it. No, you're not saving the world, you're destroying it. It's a very simple mix-up, I get it. It can be confusing, but breaking something is not fixing it. You do not, you know, take your car to the mechanic and get it back in a junk heap, and they said, I fixed it by purging it if it's impurities. <laughs> like, no. That's wrong, because it needs to be fixed, and that is not a fixed car, that is a destroyed car that a crazy madman has just said he fixed. <laughs> I have fixed your car in accordance with the prophecy. Like, no, that's sort of, it's absurd when you say it that way, but it's the logic's end conclusion. The way you, if any cost is worth bearing for your revolution, I'm going to involve a third show here real quick. Code Geass. If you haven't seen it, I recommend the shit out of it. But really quickly, that is a show that also... I'm bringing it in just as a specific note here. The show ends up being about, in Avatar's case, making people see reason, right? You know, in the end, they stop the bad guy, especially Kuvira. She's made to sort of see why she's wrong. And things get righted before they go to apocalyptic proportions of wrong every time. Sure, the world gets fucked up in Avatar The Last Airbender, but they fix it. They save it. Sure, it's damaged and different, but it's still the world. They end up doing the right thing. Code Geass is sort of where the wrong thing gets pushed to its logical conclusions, where someone's attempting to do the right thing every step of the way, but because they can't be checked, because their morality can't be questioned by people that can make them listen until far too late, the world is basically destroyed <laughs> to make it better. And then you're left wondering, was the cost worth paying at that point? Was the world worth saving with this method if it's going to be destroyed in the process? If you want to make an omelet, you got to break some eggs. Well, how many eggs is unacceptable? That's sort of the question here, right? Especially with Kuvira. She just wants to save her nation, right? Protect her people. When is it too many eggs? When you start making labor camps for dissenters, re-education centers, slave labor, building massive super weapons that can destroy cities? When, when is too many eggs broken? I think it was a while back. Yeah. See, that's, that's sort of the point that this show is making with all of its villains, right? There's a point where things go too far. doesn't matter your justification. It doesn't matter how good it makes you feel. If you're torturing people and imprisoning them for your righteous cause, your righteous cause is no longer righteous. It's that simple. It doesn't matter what you think your end goal is. It doesn't matter at that point what you think you're accomplishing. When you have to murder people, you have to you know, abduct and assassinate people. When you have to corrupt the world to achieve your vision, your vision's wrong. You are wrong. <laughs> Don't care how noble and just you think you're going to be. Look at Amon. His quest seemed of the utmost righteousness. Non-benders being represented again, fighting for an equal voice and treatment. Sounds great. Purge the benders. Fuck. <laughs> That's where it went bad. That's where it went wrong. Because equality, tolerance, understanding is not achieved by destroying the people oppressing you. Utter destruction is not the answer. Fight them if you must. But if you seek to cleanse them, you have become them. It's really that simple. 
We're trying to solve a problem, not kill people. Exactly. And the show makes the point. What does Aang almost do to Ozai? Almost kills him. What would that have done politically? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, it would have basically made him a martyr for the people who believed in that war. He was murdered by the Avatar, replaced by the puppet prince who works for him. Or You know, it would have... But taking away his bending and imprisoning him makes it just, makes it able for him to be dealt with by the court systems of his people. It puts justice where it belongs, not taken by some godlike figure in his own hands, but for the people to dispense. Look at Korra. How many times does she almost make the wrong decision, if not for the guidance of Tenzin or one of her other friends? About every other episode. <laughs> right. <laughs> but no, the serious points where, especially between her and Tenzin, where, look at season two. Under the guidance of Unalak, she almost destroys the world because, well, she's listening to the wrong people. She forsakes good guidance and honest advice for pandering. She lets her ego get the better of her. And Unalak plays her. And there's a good lesson in that. That a true friend is the person who will tell you that you're wrong when you are wrong. Not the person who agrees with you when they know you're wrong. That's a sicko fan. That's a yes man. A real friend is the person who says, dude, that's bad. Don't do that. Because sometimes, look at both, you know, Aang and... How many times does Aang need Katara to calm his rage when he's about to, like, fuck someone up or something? Like during the first episode of season two. When the Earth uh, General tries to push him, and he's about to, like, destroy their whole place, and Katara has to calm him down. Or when those uh, sandbenders steal Appa. Oh, that's a big one. Katara, again, has to calm him down, because he's probably about to do things to these people that they will remember for a very long time to come. But all he really needed was someone to hug him so that he could cry. Yes. And get over how emotional he was over the fact that he was afraid that he may have lost forever his one anchor to when he to his real time. And also his spirit totem, basically. His spirit animal. Like his best his friend. friend. Yeah. And there's that point, I think, that all of these examples, tying everything together in these lessons we've talked about, is this idea of coming together as a people to achieve things that we ourselves alone can't do. And also that we need to fight injustice, right? But do it the right way. And sometimes that does require fighting, but you need to do it without hatred. There's a difference between punching a Nazi to make it topical and trying to kill the Nazi. Punching him is a statement there. Trying to kill him because of that is entering the grounds of destroying people for their ideology alone. And isn't that exactly why we're vilifying Nazis? For destroying people for some single qualification and not their actions? Yeah, we don't need to cross that line. Do not become the thing you fight. Do not become the villain. Look at Korra. Look at Kuvira, right? She's the lesson on that, that very easily, if you feel oppressed, you feel violated, you feel hurt by others, it's easy to become stronger later, fight back, right? Take over and then hurt them back. Make them pay. What have you done then but simply become the thing that made you who you are so that you can make the next you for their side, so that you can later be the tyrant overthrown for your unjust practices by the next you you created in the camps that made yourself. You can't turn around and destroy the people that hurt you and expect the cycle of violence to end. How does Korra have to end that cycle with Kuvira? make her understand. She has to empathize with her enough to say, I understand where you're coming from, and I know why it's wrong, because I've been there. Here's why you should see reason. Let me show you mercy. But, you know, it wasn't a point of she showed mercy the whole time or right away. She had to beat her first, and then extend mercy. Isn't that the point? You should defeat your enemies, but you should do so with justice and with kindness and mercy when it's deserved.